evening, everybody. Good Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, spending time with our own God's Word, and I've said this before, when, when you think about Thanksgiving and, you know, there's nothing really biblical about a Thanksgiving festival or a holiday or anything like that, but just a, a, a good reminder, generally speaking, and very specifically speaking, to say thank you, thank you, Lord, for how many blessings. You're throwing me off, Screamins. You're usually sitting over there. <laughs> My brain's scrambled now. Here we go. No, it's good. Good to have you over there. Um, saying thank you. Thank you to God for... for Physical blessings, of course, but, but more importantly, spiritual blessings. And so when we go through our service tonight, we're, we're basically revolving around our three little meditations, revolving around the word peace. And then when you think about peace and the blessing of thanksgiving and reasons to give thanks to God, um, there, there really is a, a, a very direct practical application of the Trinity, uh, the peace that we as Sinners, as human beings, receive through the, the work, through the blessings of, of the Trinity. So, um, let's begin. Let's begin our Thanksgiving worship and do that uh, towards the bottom of page two of the hard copy. We begin our worship tonight in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. We ask in this prayer that God will help us realize His goodness and to receive our daily bread for the next day. Give us this day our daily bread. The daily bread includes everything we need in this life, such as our food, drink, clothing, home, and property, our work, income, tax, and medication. A good reputation, true friends and neighbors. God gives daily bread even though we don't deserve it. In response to one of Satan's temptations to him, Jesus reminds us, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus is the word of God and also became a man for us. He is the bread of life and the biggest reason to give thanks. Dear Lord, we give you our humble thanks and praise. Grab a hymnal, please. Our first hymn is 609.
Would you please stand? We'll join together in our prayer of the day, prayer of the night, and we'll roll right into Psalm 136. Let's pray together our prayer of the day. O oh, merciful God, we owe you endless thanks for the many great things you have done for us. We especially thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. Accept our thanksgiving and prayer. Pardon our sins, help our weaknesses, and finally receive us into your eternal glory. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Right? We're very familiar with the, the common table prayers. We say that whenever... We have a group of potluck or whatever. Let's join in the common table prayers. I don't know what the etymology is of the first prayer that we say that we usually say before eating, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, let these gifts. I don't know the etymology to that. But when we, what my dad would say, return thanks, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever, that is right from Scripture, right from the Psalms. And right when you think about that, when, when we use that table prayer for giving thanks, certainly thank God for the food that we just ate and the food we'll eat tomorrow and the next day, etc. But when, when we end that short little prayer, his love endures forever, right? The steak that I just ate isn't going to last forever, but God's love, his mercy, forgiveness does, that, that lasts for eternity in heaven. So whenever we go through that little prayer, just, just remember that that very, very important reminder, his love. His love endures forever. Yeah, thanks, God, for the, the stuff. But more importantly, your blessing. So, part of Psalm 136, bottom of page 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders... Who by his understanding made the heavens? His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters? His love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Please be seated and let's give our attention to the choir.
Squire, thanks for sharing your time. Thanks for sharing your gifts with us. We do appreciate that. Our first meditation tonight comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 45. Jesus says, He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Can you think of the first gift that you've ever received as a child, whenever, the first gift that you received? Maybe you think maybe back to a teddy bear that you got from grandma or grandpa. I remember my mom hiding a pop gun above the refrigerator on my brother's birthday, and he was getting a present, and I wasn't, and I was whining. I remember the gift. They said, oh, here's a pop gun for you, too. Quit your whining, Paul. You think of a gift from early on, that kind of stuff, a toy, things like that, a gift from mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, probably thinking of something, right? A gift, a physical gift that you received. But when we think about what Jesus is saying in here in Matthew 5, when we talk about the first gift that you and I ever received is exactly the same gift a gift that came from our gracious and holy God, a gift of life. And this is even before you can start talking about faith or a person not having faith, believer or unbeliever. We're talking here about the gift of life that Scripture, we refer to this incredible gift of life as a time of grace when we think of all the blessings that you and I receive through uh, an earthly lifetime, that we think of a the first priority when we have this gift of life that was given to us as life was created in our mother's wombs, and we think of what is the purpose of that gift of life. I think of that gift and I think of the second gift that was given to me. second gift was the gift of those parents bringing me into the word of God, following through the gift of my Christian parents and the Christian examples that they gave to me. And you make a connection there and say, what, what is the first most important gift? What is the purpose of that most important gift? A time of grace, a lifetime. Think of the opportunity that every sinner has in that time of grace, that exact same gift, some longer, some shorter, gifts, but the exact same purpose of learning of Jesus Christ and learning what he did for the forgiveness of sins. And you think about the first article, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I suppose it's the first article that really has the most direct physical connection with our national holiday of Thanksgiving when you look up front and see canned goods and all this stuff and, and food and gourds and physical blessings you think of what God the Father does for us. Yeah, he gives me my life. He gives us the universe, the creation around that supports our life. He does everything in order to preserve our lives, preserve that opportunity, the chance, the only chance, the only chance that any person has to hear about Jesus and what Jesus did to forgive our sins. And so we look here. Jesus is saying these words. This is Matthew chapter 5, kind of towards the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he's teaching a lesson here. This is part of a lesson that he's teaching about. Remember, Christians, love your enemies, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Why? For the purpose of sharing Jesus Christ. For the purpose of taking advantage of a time of grace. That my time of grace certainly is meant for me personally to learn about Jesus and reach eternal life in heaven. But then also, I as a Christian, as a personal individual missionary, also have the privilege, the responsibility of using that time of grace for those around me. To encourage one another, people sitting in this room to encourage one another, a co-worker, to, to encourage about Jesus and say, it's the only opportunity. Can I help you take advantage of that time of grace and learn about Jesus as Lord and Savior? So when we're talking about peace, when you talk about physical peace, right, it's not just the turkey or the steak or the ham or whatever we're going to be eating tomorrow and all those physical blessings and the furnace and a car and all that stuff. But right, physical peace, to say thank you, God, for 
peace in a nation. Kind of nice that we don't have to run across the street dodging bullets to get to church, right? We're not in a war zone. That kind of peace, kind of nice to have the, the peace of a somewhat stable government, right? And to live in that peace and not just enjoy the blessings and the material stuff that God, and he does, he gives us all that stuff to enjoy. And let's enjoy him and remember to thank God for it. But more importantly, thank you, Lord, for the time of grace. Thank you for my physical peace, that physical peace which allows me to grow in your grace and allows me to serve you. So would you read with me, and let's read just that verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Uh, let's read that together. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And let's read together a first article, first article of the Apostles' Creed. We continue. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me with all creatures, giving me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my faculties, and that he still preserves me, therefore richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, meat and drink, house, wife and children, land, cattle, and all my goods, and all that I need to keep my body in life, defending me against all danger, and guarding and protecting me from all evil. All this purely out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me, for all of which it is my duty to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. First verse of Now Thank We All Our God. the connection in round two here that we have. Thanks for peace. Thank God for global peace. John 3.16. God so loved the world. Global peace. Okay. John 3.16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Peace, global peace. I suppose that's uh, a concept that's more familiar to people, even Christians, a few weeks from now when we get to Christmas and the Christmas story, Luke 2, and the angels announcing to the shepherds, a Savior has been born, peace on earth and goodwill towards men, right? The very popular misunderstanding of that word peace, peace, peace on the world, global peace. But when we think about Jesus Christ and what has been accomplished for us, and we look at this second article of the Apostles' Creed, focusing on that second person of the Trinity, we think of that word redemption. Jesus redeemed all people by what he accomplished through his holy life, his, his innocent death on the cross and his glorious resurrection. 
that you think of peace, maybe you think of the word peace treaty, that the peace treaty is signed between at least two nations. We're not going to fight against you if you don't fight against us. That kind of peace, peace between the Arabs and Israelis, peace between all mankind. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all hold hands and drink a Coke together? Sure would be. But you ever think about it? what it would be like if everybody was a Christian. Wouldn't there be world peace? But I would venture to say, even as Christians, is there always peace? Is there always peace even between Christians? Peace between husband and wife? Peace between parents and children? You think of the reality of sin, the reality of sin that even between Christians, is there always peace? Not necessarily. There is the result of sin and the consequences of sin in our lives that show its ugly head so often in, in so many different ways. But when we talk about global peace, God so loved the world, of course you and I know that he's not talking about that kind of peace. But he's talking about the peace, the contentment that goes along with knowing my, our sins are forgiven through Jesus. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son to do for us what we could not do ever on our own. And so we thank God on a Thanksgiving evening, a Thanksgiving day tomorrow, and say thank you for global peace. Did Jesus just die for a certain kind of person? When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, he said, it is finished for all people, all sinners. I've done the work of pain for your sins. There is that peace that is offered to all people, that peace that is available to all people, all sinners throughout history, global peace through Jesus Christ. And when we get to the third article, we'll remind ourselves how it is that a sinner, how you and I have been blessed with that peace and how it's offered and given to those around us. So we thank God. Thank God on a Thanksgiving, on any day for that matter. Thank God for peace, global peace, the global peace of our Savior Jesus. Let's read together the words of the second article of the Apostles' Creed and Luther's explanation to that second article, bottom of page 5. We join together. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord who has redeemed me a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent sufferings and death, that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence and blessedness, even as he is risen from death, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Verse 2. Now thank we all are God. Number three, 
basically focusing on the Holy Spirit, work of the Holy Spirit, the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Psalm 4, verse 8 says, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Very personal, very personal words that were written by King David concerning his very personal, sinful, repentant situation of sin and grace. When you think about the opposite of peace, maybe words like distress, agony come to mind. And certainly we see distress and agony that go along with David's life as he reacted to his, his sinful nature, as he reacted to his sinful reality in his life. It was just last week or two weeks ago that I referred to this exact same situation for David that when you really read through his psalms and you read through a psalm and talk about being in the pit of despair and, and the agony and the distress of, of sins nagging at us, but then also coming across a, a, a psalm like this, Psalm 4, that talks about, in peace I will lie down in safety. Because he knew, he knew that contrast of impenitence, not repenting, not confessing sin, living in the reality of that agony of impenitence, but then having the loving patience of a forgiving God address it? He wasn't going out of his way to look for repentance or to give repentance and confession to God. David wasn't doing that. Do you notice how God instigated and started that whole process? It was God who sent the prophet Nathan to David. It was that prophet Nathan that showed David his sins. Yeah, then David repented, and it was that prophet of Nathan speaking for God on God's behalf that said, oh, your sins are forgiven, the exact same process that you and I go through. You think about how God has reached to you and how God has reached out to me? Again, not by my own choosing and strength, not by what I've decided to do, but through gifts, reasons of peace that God has placed in our lives. I've mentioned before the incredible blessing of Christian parents slash family that I've been given, many of you, all of you have been given, and to say, to have that peace, that personal peace that is yours and mine through the gift of faith, the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit that <laughs> I cannot, I never will, I never will approach God on my own initially to say, God, I rely on you for my Savior. It's that gift of faith that allows us to make that decision, to say, I'm going to come to church tonight and worship my Lord and God. I'm going to grow in my faith. After that faith has been planted by the Holy Spirit, oh yeah, then there are all kinds of decisions, right? All kinds of decisions on how to use God's blessings. The physical stuff. The peace, the security, the pleasures, the happiness that God blesses us with. Okay, let's use all those gifts in a God-pleasing way. But more importantly, going all the way back, right? Circling back to that first person of the Trinity, the first article, the work of God the Father, the decisions that we make in our times of grace as we first and foremost make decisions regarding our faith. What am I going to do? How is what my decision is going to affect my faith? Is it going to affect my faith? Is it going to affect my eternal salvation? That personal peace, the personal promise that you and I have through God the Holy Spirit's gift of faith. And so we use that time of grace, those times of grace, to use all three of those tools that the Holy Spirit uses to create and strengthen faith. We grow in God's word, the spoken, written word. We take advantage of that gift of baptism that God gives us that creates and strengthens faith. And we also use that third gift, that third means of grace, his Lord's Supper, his Holy Supper, that does exactly the same thing, creates and strengthens that individual, that personal peace, the peace of God's grace, the peace of God's forgiveness in your hearts and in mine. So let's read together, reminding ourselves about that work of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, going through the words of the third article, the, of, uh, and then Luther's explanation, bottom of page 6. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, nor come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the one true faith. In like manner, as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith, in which Christian church he daily and richly forgives all sins to me and all believers, and will at the last day raise up me and all the dead, and give unto me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. Verse 3. gather our thank offerings. Clara? Thanks, Clara. Can we say thank you to Clara? I didn't know she was going to be playing tonight. Thank you for doing that. Clara Eaker, by the way. All right. Would you please stand and let's join together in our response of Thanksgiving prayer. Page 7. We pray. Almighty God, Lord of the harvest, creator and sustainer of everything, giver of every good and perfect gift. Accept the praise you raise for all the goodness of your name. For all the grains of the field and all the food of the vine. Accept our thanks, O faithful God. For all the fruits of the tree and all that grows beneath the ground. Accept our praise, O gracious Lord. For our friends and family and for all who help us in our earthly lives. For hospitals and doctors and nurses who help us in our health. For all the things of this life which aren't necessary, but yet give us joy and pleasure. Make us truly grateful for every evidence of your abounding love and care. Give us grace to share with others from all that you provide for us. 
We ask for these things through Jesus Christ, your greatest gift to us. And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn there. That's hymn 615.